Why make a narrative film when you've had so much success with documentaries? I like to take risks and I've always wanted to do a scripted film. I like the collaborative nature of scripted. I love working with the actors. I love working with the DP. Um, you know, when you're shooting a documentary, you don't necessarily know what you're going to get sometimes when you go on a shoot. And sometimes it can be very dependent on the subject. And, you know, if, especially if you're dealing with a celebrity or if you're shooting verite, you know, is, is it gonna be interesting? You're, you're at that mercy and a lot of it's crafted in post of what you shoot and whatnot. With scripted, uh, the idea that you can be writing something completely by yourself or on an airplane, looks like words go from your head to the page. And a year later, <laughs> these are being acted out and you're filming it and you're structurally telling the story, to me is incredible. Um, shooting Grace Point was one of the best experiences of my entire life, not just a best experiences in work, my life. Uh, I made a joke that uh, at the premiere was the best experience and I had to table that and say, next to getting married, then I had to table it again after my kids were being born. But anyway, uh, yeah, it was just so cool. And then I love, you think about movies. Movies actually do change people's lives. I mean, everyone has a favorite movie. And I just love, I love all kinds of film. Uh, I think about like my favorite, my favorite comedies, Elf. I love the movie Elf. And every time I watch it, every Christmas, I laugh at something different. And I'm always hysterically laughing. Like, I know what's gonna happen. <laughs> like, why am I still laughing at this movie? But here I am laughing. Every time the Shawshank Redemption's on, I'm watching it on TV. It doesn't matter where I stop in the film, I'm watching the movie. A couple weeks ago, I'm up till two in the morning. I know exactly what's gonna happen, yet I'm still watching it. Why does it have this effect on me? Goodwill Hunting. I saw Goodwill Hunting in the theater cried in the theater watching the movie. Of course, the scene with Robin Williams when he's telling him it's not your fault. I'm watching this scene 20 years later with my younger son. Same deal, we're crying, it's not your fault. They just have such an impact, movies. Um, I just think it's one of our greatest art forms that we have and I think that uh, even Top Gun Maverick, I mean, what a movie this movie is. I don't know if you've seen it, but if you haven't, you're severely missing out. It, I'm sitting there crying in Top Gun. I cry a lot, I guess, but I'm, I'm crying in Top Gun Maverick. It's so well done. It's so awesome. The sound's so incredible. It just really takes you back. And I don't know. And the other thing is movies live forever. They live forever. Like they're timeless. Like they're set in a time and they never go away. I watched Goodfellas with my sons and Ray Liotta is just like a young man in that movie. And now he's passed away. And my son's like, who is this guy? And like, he didn't know who he was. And he looked at him, oh, he passed away. But he'll always live, his youth will always be captured in that film. So, you know, documentaries, there is sometimes a shelf life on them, you know, within the time, it depends, but on what you're doing. But I think for me, like, uh, there's some sort of timelessness to movies and being able to have that effect. And Grace Point was a really cool story that I was presented with. And I love a coming of age film. It's probably my favorite genre. I love Stand By Me, it's one of my favorite movies. And I also love thrillers, huge thriller fan. Um, not necessarily action, but thriller. So trying to blend those two together on a budget. We had a m movie was shot for around $500,000. It's not a whole lot of money um, to do a thriller on, so. Uh, it, it was, no pun intended, a great thrill for me. How much of a risk was it to take on this movie? Well, for me, it, it didn't feel like a risk, you know? I mean, I'm about calculated risks. So to me, a risk is like, I'm just gonna jump off a bridge and hopefully I'll hit the water, you know, and, and, and live. But then there's people who like, yeah, they're like professional stunt people on they bungee jump off a bridge and they've like kind of like measured the risks or they skydive and they've like Tom Cruise is a big risk taker in Mission Impossible but I bet you better believe he's worked on these stunts for like a year so I look at it like a calculated risk and yes I'm comparing myself to Tom Cruise in Mission <laughs> Impossible but uh, 
I just looked at it like, I, I, there's no way, to me it's a bigger risk to have died and not have tried it. I, I just couldn't live with myself. This is something I've been wanting to do since I was 20 years old and it wasn't happening. Like, <laughs> I, I had I, this, this script, it was in development for a long time. At one point it was called something else. It was written by this writer, Paul Russell Smith. And it was like a big movie, a much bigger film. And it went down, actors were attached to it, and it just wasn't happening. And if you want something done, sometimes you gotta just do it yourself. You gotta find a way. So I got the money together and rewrote it so that we could film it on this budget. People worked for free on it. Uh, some people, or they at least worked for like scale. And we got it done and, and people believed in it. So to me, there's a bigger risk in not doing it. Like, same way um, I look at it with, I, I wanted to fight and people are like, well, you could get a concussion or what if you get, I tr true, but to me it would be worse to have said, man, I always wanted to try that and didn't have the cojones to do it. That, to me, that's a greater risk. And you have a great video when you finished it that people can watch, I don't know. They can find it on the, your- The fight? Yeah, afterwards. Yeah, yeah, no, they filmed it for the UFC. Uh, the, the advantages of having a production team. Yeah, it's like slow motion and people are mic'd up and yeah, it was awesome. Um, so somebody asked me what was a better experience, the fight or making the movie? And I'm like, man, that's a tough one. I don't know. I mean, I still feel like movie making's in my wheelhouse. Fighting is not. So I don't know. The fact that I did that in one, that's pretty hard to, to beat. What inspired Grace Point? So Grace Point tells the story of uh, a young man on his way to rehab with his father, played by Andrew McCarthy. The young man's played by John Owen Lowe, who's Rob Lowe's son. And uh, along the way, they stop on a town in this town called Grace Point for gas. The dad encounters some some bad guys, some bad people, gets hurt, and it's up to the son to save him but the son has to do this all now while he's detoxing from drugs. So it's kind of, he has to learn about himself while he's going through this. And at the same time, uh, you know, become the hero, I think is a big theme of the movie, become the hero. So what inspired it was I met John Owen Lowe, man, at this point it must be five, six years ago. Uh, Maybe, maybe less than that. I was working on a project called, with his dad called Madness in the Hills, which was about the mudslides that hit Montecito, California. And Rob was like, you should talk to my son. He lost someone very close to him in the mudslides, a former classmate. So we met up at the Apple Pan in LA. And then kind of like with Luke Perry, he and I just instantly clicked. Sometimes you connect with somebody and we just, I don't know, I just liked his vibe. I thought he was very talented, just understood storytelling, but almost inhibited in a way because of who his father was, like the, getting prejudged somewhat. So I, I presented him a, a couple years later, did he want to do this movie with me? And I said, I thought the character he could really relate to. So he read the script, he just told me I'm in, let's do it. He became a producer on it. He helped cast some of the actors and he even rewrote a scene that's in the end of the, well, I don't want to give anything away, but he wrote, rewrote a scene between him and the dad. And I was like, wow, that's a really powerful piece of writing. Where did you get that from? He's like, oh, I was between me and my dad. So um, yeah, he, he was a big catalyst for the movie moving forward. What was the writing process like for Grace Point? Well, I, the writing process was really kind of uh, taking it almost backwards. Like I, I read this book by Robert Rodriguez, uh, Rebel Without a Crew, and he said, you write with what you have. So I looked at everything we could get in North Carolina for free and wrote off of that. So um, based off of like getting the story, like, hey, we could shoot in this side of town. Well, what's in this part of town? You know, there's airplanes. Oh, let's write a scene with airplanes and try to base the story around that. Oh, we can get a horse. Let's put a horse in the movie. We can get an ATV. Let's put ATVs in the movie. So uh, that was a big part of it, um, knowing what we could get and writing off of that. 
because we had a, a kind of a strict budget. And so you were doing uh, rewrites of the screenplay? Yeah, so it was, a, it was an existing screenplay. It was much bigger in scope. And I did like pretty much a page one rewrite on it. But the bones are still there, and that's why we share co-writer credit. How did you determine the budget? <sighs> Just what, mainly what I could raise and, and went backwards off of that and put a lot of my own money into it as well. Uh, my production company's money. So, um, you know, there's certain things that I just felt had to be at a certain level of professionalism that did cost money. And while we shot in North Carolina, most people, unlike Los Angeles, you can't go home at night. So we had, hotels were expensive. Just, and just having uh, trailers for people were expensive. And that food is expensive. That's what I tell people, like, Make sure you feed people because people will put up with not getting paid much. But if you're not feeding them well, that's where people start to fight and get at each other. So one of the actors came to my hotel room and he was he's like, man, we got to talk. And I was like, what's up, man? He's like, you got to do something about this lunch. This <laughs> lunch sucks. And I was like, what? And the problem was the catering team and they were great. They were putting all their energy into the last meal of the day, dinner. And I was like, this is actually the least important meal because everyone just wants to leave. The most important meal is lunch. You need to have the, a banger of a lunch, like options, like tons of stuff, tons of drinks. So they figured it out. Then, then that actor's like, yo, big improvement with lunch. That's where I was getting my compliments on set with the, the catering, you know. It's true. Not much of a director, but I make sure people are fed, so. And various professionals told you this was a mistake putting your own money in or yeah a film in general no a lot of people told me it was a mistake but I didn't view it that way uh, like I, I said to me it would have been a mistake to not do it and uh, I don't believe in playing it safe um, I, this is something I wanted to try for a long time and especially during COVID I saw like life can change on a dime and I saw Jim Carrey said once that he learned from his father, you can, be, you can be miserable and fail at what you don't like doing. So why don't you try doing it what you like? So that, that's how I viewed it. Um, I wanted to try this. And, and the people that were telling me this were not creative people. It was like a lawyer, an agent, and they don't get it at the end of the day. They won't understand it and I don't expect them to. But, uh, you know, I have a new lawyer and a new agent now, so. <laughs> well, I always love that story, too, that Jim Carrey talked about. I think his dad was either working for an, a company or he's an accountant or something. Then at 52, I think they let him go. And right. so uh, that's the story that's always stayed with me. You, you did the movie for the same reason that you did a cage fight? <laughs> it, no, in, in, in all seriousness, that you wanted to just experience it? Somewhat. I mean, I have no uh, blind ambitions. I'm going to be a professional cage fighter. So that was more about the one time experience. I would love to have a career as a scripted filmmaker. But yes, to have that, I, I was willing to, to fail at it. And there's been time, there were times when I watched the cut and I was like, well, I tried, you know, I watched it. I was like, this is not good. And uh, should, should have stuck to what I know. But I think every filmmaker feels that way. And I love writing and I love directing and I have a, some now some scripted things in development. So I'd love to be able to make that switch and keep telling stories. So I would say comparable, yes, but no illusions, never fighting in a cage again, unless I'm like kidnapped or something, I'm retiring at one and oh, but uh, I hope to direct many more projects. But you took a similar mindset into it so that if, if quote unquote, yeah. it failed. Are you familiar with the philosopher Drake? He says YOLO. It means you only <laughs> live once. So I believe in that. I, I believe that we only live one time. So I think sometimes, I didn't understand this. Someone explained it to me. I think people, they're, it sometimes it's easier to dream and then to have that dream. And then sometimes people just can't live with if the dream doesn't come true. So sometimes it, maybe it's easier to not try because you can still keep in your back pocket. I could have done that. 
I should have, you know, versus I did do it and it didn't work out. So I think uh, you got to be willing to fail. I'm not, I'm not that talented of a person. I don't think I'm not that talented, but I have a lot of perseverance. And I think that sometimes is more important uh, than talent and knowing what you don't know, surrounding yourself with good people. Uh, one of the scripts I'm developing has like effects in it. And um, I don't, I'm not, I talked to the, my DP and I was like, let's get on the phone with some effects people that we, tr like let's find out projects we like, contact those people, learn. And I think, you know, um, when people reach out to me for advice, uh, and, and when I have a project that comes out, it'll come in waves. Like if I have like something that's on Netflix or ESPN, I'll get like a good group of emails coming in from all age groups, high school, college, people in their thirties and forties. And most of my advice is the same. Take action. You've got to take action. Don't stand still. If you want to shoot something, shoot something, pick up your camera and shoot something. Don't wait for LeBron James to give you full access. Shoot the middle school coach. Uh, if you want to edit, buy, buy Premiere and put it on your computer and start editing wedding videos. You're way better starting at something. If you wanna write, get Final Draft, start writing. You know, my, I told my old high school teacher this. I'm like, start, write. It doesn't matter if it sucks. It's gonna suck. It's gonna be terrible at the beginning. You get better writing is rewriting. So just get started. There's no, there's very few like pie in the sky situations. Sometimes people are like, I have this great idea. Who cares? I mean, no offense, <laughs> but like I mean, your idea means nothing. It could be the greatest idea ever, but unless you can execute the idea, that's what's impressive. Can you have an idea and then see it through to fruition? So, uh, that would be my biggest advice. If you're sitting still right now watching this, press pause and leave and go do something. How much do regrets affect you? Regret? I don't have many regrets. I mean, I don't think, I, I read somewhere that when you think of the past, it leads to depression. And when you think of the future, it leads to anxiety. So I try to live in the present as much as possible. I don't always do that, uh, I'm not perfect. And I, like everyone else, I do have some regrets, but <clears throat> uh, it's, they're not the regrets of like not doing something, you know? I, I'd rather, if you see uh, a pretty girl I'd, at the bar, I'd rather approach, get denied and embarrassed and wonder what could have happened, so. I look at that with filmmaking or anything else. Um, you know, again, it's better. What is it better to, what's the saying? Have lived and lost or loved and lost than not loved at all. Yeah. Something like that. Something. Yeah. I just wondered if you, you didn't really have too many and that you took, always took action. I tried, you know, I've tried, um, maybe more regrets of like, I wish I didn't say this to this person or something like, sure. like those kinds of things. That's human. Yeah. yeah.